Hee Hee 911 left the station as Yezet arrived at the platform. He fought his way onto the 917, the train moved out with men running alongside. Grabbing an overhead railing, he chose to stay near the exit, too far in would mean a return struggle at marine lines. He squeezed himself nearer one of the fans, though, to minimize his own sweating and the smell of armpits around him. These tactical maneuvers were performed by instinct, the instinct for survival in the urban jungle, he used to joke with college friends, instead of tree branches, you swung from railings inside trains and buses, hung from bars outside them. Tarzan comics and the novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs were more instructive than he or his teachers had imagined. His dream for an end to this eight-man commute had led him to apply for immigration to Canada. He wanted clean cities, clean air, plenty of water, trains with seats for everyone, where people stood in line at bus stops and said please, after you, thank you. Not just the land of milk and honey, also the land of deodorant and toiletry. But his fantasy about that new life in a new land had niched quickly, Canada was done with. And he assuaged his disappointment by keeping track of problems in the land of excess and superuity, as he now called it, unemployment, violent crime, homelessness, language laws of Quebec. Not much deerence between there and here, he would think, we have beggars in Bombay, they have people freezing to death on Toronto streets, instead of high and low caste guiding, racism and police. Shootings, separatists in Kashmir, separatists in Quebec, why migrate from the frying pan into the re? Of course, there were times when he wished his application had been successful. That immigration osair, bastard racist, he thought, I'll never forget his name. If I'd been accepted, Jal and Kumi would have been forced to look after the chief, they couldn't have driven him in an ambulance to Canada. Ten days of Nariman's three weeks bedrest had elapsed. Almost halfway there. But it troubled him to see Roxana struggling to cope, pretending everything was normal. He thought about their quarrel that morning, and later, she had stopped him for an extra kiss before he left for work. They had held each other on the landing, RST checking Villy Cardmaster's peephole, the smallest noise could summon her eye. The sense of lurking danger made the kiss sweeter. But Roxana didn't know that since Nariman came to stay he'd been late for work every day, it would have given her. One more thing to worry about. At Marine Line Station, the crowd trying to get on met the avalanche of alighting passengers. He pushed himself clear, glancing at his watch, 9.30 already, and mopped his face. The air was a gigantic wet sponge. He thrust the damp handkerchief into his pocket and waited to cross the road. Being manager of the Bombay Sporting Goods Emporium meant he had to unlock the shop door by 9.30 to let in the peon who swept and swabbed the entrance and the front steps, made tea, and dusted the glass cases displaying cricket bats, stumps, caps, footballs, badminton rackets, and other samples from their stock. Then the peon, Hussein, would remove padlocks from the security shutters that covered the two large windows. Clanking and rattling, the steel would roll up, revealing plate glass behind which sat more sports equipment. Now Hussein would take his cloth and give the glass a quick shine. By 10 o'clock they would be open for business. It was an eight-minute walk to the shop, and Yezad increased his pace. Hussein would be waiting, his Kohli and Jogeshwari, rented on a 12-hour basis, had to be vacated at 7 a.m. when the other renter arrived from his factory night shift. So he killed time near the shop, aware that he was more fortunate than those who rented eight-hour rooms. Yezid's haste was not for Hussein's Baini T, who was content to sit on the step, she was RST pawn of the day, watch the world go by. The proprietor sometimes appeared early at the shop, and to be seen coming late made Yezid feel like a schoolboy. Six shops down from the Bombay Sporting Goods Emporium was the Jai Hind Book Mart, texts for schools and colleges, reference books are specialty, stated its signboard. It, too, opened for business at ten. Vila's Rain sat outside, leaning against the locked doors, a clipboard and writing paper in his lap. He raised his hand in greeting. Yezad nodded, waving back, and hurried on. No need to rush, Mr. Kapoor hasn't come yet. Oh, good. When he reached the shop, Hussein rose from his haunches and salaamed. Yezad unlocked the door and tossed his briefcase in his chair before returning to Vila's. Busy? Lots of scribbling? Nothing so far, said Vilas, holding up the clipboard to reveal the blank page. Besides his job as a salesman at the bookmart, Vilas had a sideline. He was a writer of letters for those who couldn't, who poured out, into his willing ear, their thoughts, feelings, concerns, their very hearts, which he transformed into words upon paper at the nominal rate of three rupees per page. The language could be one of three, Hindi, Marathi, or Gujarati, depending on the clients, mainly laborers come to the city from distant villages to work at the docks or on construction sites. A scribe-written letter was their only link with their families. Sometimes, a client on a tight budget became silent when Vila's reign's pen had led up the audible number of pages. If it was a ramble, with the main substance already committed to paper, Vila's wound up the letter. But there were occasions when a customer, describing something crucial, in a voice fraught with emotion, would choke back the words because he had run out of money. Then Vila's would take what was o-aired and ask the man to continue at no charge till his heart had been lightened, while his pen turned the outpourings into narrative, into something tangible that the customer could carry to the post OCE and CO on its long journey to his family. You'll never be a good businessman, Yezid chided him. Do you think Bombay Sporting would last if Mr. Kapoor gave away cricket bats for free? What to do, I'm human, said Vilas. Nothing is more cruel than a letter cut short for lack of money. It's like death, one moment the words owing, next moment silence, the thought unnished, the love unconveyed, the anguish unexpressed. How can I let that happen? Sometimes, my clients receive this type of truncated letter from their village. I read it to them. And suddenly, in mid-sentence, it ends. The pain it causes is unbearable. I'll never do something so unkind. 
Vila's reign sideline as a scribe had started accidentally when a cleaner was hired to work at the bookmart. One morning while dusting the shelves and stacks, he said to Vila's, isn't life a funny thing, Renegi? Here I am with books all day. I feel them in my hands and smell them, sometimes even dream about them. And yet, not a single word can I read. The observation touched Vila's more profoundly than the periodic governmental laments and platitudes about illiteracy in the country. So you want to learn to read, he asked the cleaner, whose name was Suresh. No, 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 he said bashfully. My brain is not willing to learn something so decult. No, all I want is for you to write a letter for me. After the shop had closed, the two sat on the steps in Vila's, prepared to scribble a quick paragraph. Between the salutation, my dear Pataji and Mataji and the leave-taking, your obedient son, he led VE pages. Three weeks later came a reply, the RST letter Suresh had ever received. He held his breath, watching as his benefactor took a sandalwood letter opener from the counter display and slit the envelope. Only one page, observed Suresh sadly. Don't be disappointed, said Vilas. A letter is like perfume. You don't apply a whole bottle. Just one dab will LL your senses. Words are the same, a few are suicient. Suresh was skeptical as Vilas began to read the scrawl of the village scribe. There were invocations for success and good wishes for health and prosperity. But the rest was devoted to conveying the family's happiness at listening to Suresh's letter. Such a beautiful letter, they said, it is like being with you in the city, sharing your life, taking the train to your bookshop, watching you work. And we hear your voice in every line, so wonderful is the EECT of the words. Suresh was glowing with pride as the letter ended. One page only, said Vilas. And see how much pleasure it has given you? The cleaner began telling neighbors in his chawl about the marvelous letter writer who had transported his thoughts and feelings to his family. And it was not long before Vilas's scribal services were formalized into a full-edged sideline. On the steps of Jai Hind Book Mart his clients gazed in wistful wonder at his penmanship, like the hungry on a feast to which they had no hope of being invited. From time to time, Yezad tried convincing him to charge more. But Vila said higher rates would mean fewer letters, besides, he had come to regard this as a form of social work. If he didn't do it, his clients might turn for help to a shifts and a shaka where they would be exposed to vicious communal propaganda, might even get recruited in their sticks and stones method of political persuasion, their any art of scoring debating points by breaking opposition bones. But let me be honest. More than anything else, I enjoy the letter writing. More than your acting group, asked Yezid, for Vilas used to speak with great passion about his amateur drama society. That hobby is gone. There are some new members who think they know everything. They conduct workshops and discuss theories. Not my cup of tea. But his satisfaction from letter writing grew more profound with time. He heard all about his clients' lives, the birth of a child, a family quarrel about money, a wife left behind in the village who was sleeping with the sarpanch, a sick father who had died because the nearest hospital was two days' travel on Kutcha roads, a brother injured in a farm accident who had recovered and was home again. And Vilas, writing and reading the ongoing drama of family matters, the endless tragedy and comedy, realized that collectively, the letters formed a pattern only he was privileged to see. He let the mail out through his consciousness, allowing the episodes to fall into place of their own accord, like bits of colored glass in a kaleidoscope. He felt that chance events, random cruelty, unexplainable kindness, meaningless disaster, unexpected. Generosity could, together, form a design that was otherwise invisible. If it were possible to read letters for all of humanity, compose an innity of responses on their behalf, he would have a God's eye view of the world and be able to understand it. Best of all, he told Yezid, it gives me so many ready-made families. I share their lives, like an uncle or grandfather who knows everything about everyone. Isn't that a wonderful reward? I'm having enough trouble with one family. If you're not busy, write a letter for me. Sure, said Vilas. To whom? God. To my brother and sister-in-law. Those bastards are making my life miserable. Two of them with nothing to do all day in their huge house. He wastes his time at the Sher Bazaar, she at the Retemple. And they can't even look after their poor father. My wife has to slave instead. No room to move in the at, and every night his bad dreams wake us up. Vilas urged patience, reminding him that in ten more days his father-in-law would return home and life would return to normal. Thank you for the obvious advice, said Yezid. Where do you get such wisdom? Through my sideline. I write letters, therefore I am. Ah, of course. See you later, Monsieur Rain, said Yezid, and started back for the shop. At the Bombay Sporting Goods Emporium, the steel shutters were still down, the litter in front of the shop not picked up. The shop was dark. Yezad switched on the lights. Nothing had been dusted, the tea hadn't been made. Hussein. Where are you? Sahab will be here any minute. He found the peon sitting on the oar in a corner of the storage area. Hugging his knees, which were drawn up to his chin, he was gazing at the wall. He looked up with a wan smile when Yezad approached. Chelo, Hussein, start working. Hussein returned his gaze to the wall and murmured, Sorry, Sahab, today I don't feel able. Yezad sighed, studying the grizzled fellow in his khaki shirt and trousers. The collar was frayed, the knees worn thin. Time to order replacement uniforms for him. Though it was not really a uniform, Mr. Kapoor provided two sets of the out tea periodically, to help Hussein out. He wondered whether to try and persuade the peon to rise, or leave him for Mr. Kapoor. Hussein had been hired at Bombay Sporting almost three years ago, several months after the Babri Mosque riots, at the urging of the Ekta Samadhi, which was asking businesses to help rehabilitate riot victims. 
On the days that Hussein was incapable of working, Mr. Kapoor was the one who nursed his battered emotions till he was ready to resume his duties. Whenever Yezid found himself getting annoyed by Hussein, he would remind himself about the peon story, about the burning chawls in Antop Hill, Gundas setting people on re. Hussein and his Muslim neighbors watching as their chawl went up in Ames, wondering where his wife and three sons were. And then four. Burning girls tumbling down the steps of the building, their smoking hands beating at the Ames. While the Gundas sprinkled more kerosene from their cans over Hussein's family. In the dark storage area, Yezad shuddered. What about Chai, Hussein? He tried to draw him into conversation. Don't you want a cup this morning? Chai, no chai, all the same, Sahab. Yezid wondered why, on these days of black depression, Hussein came to the shop to sit in the corner. Mr. Kapoor had assured him he would not lose any wages if he was unwell. But perhaps on such days, more than ever, Hussein needed the company of those he trusted. The telephone rang. Hussein did not move from his corner. At the best of times he was reluctant to pick up the receiver with its gaping mouth. The instruments scared him, its power to carry disembodied voices making him wary of sending his own into it, to end up who knew where. Yezid answered on the FTH ring, it was Mr. Kapoor. Hello, Yezid. Sorry, were you with a client? No, with Hussein. He's sitting in the back today. Airy, poor fellow. Another one of his bad days? Okay, just let him relax. And your invoices to be delivered? Tomorrow, Yezid. Or day after, doesn't matter. Mr. Kapoor was about to hang up, then stopped himself, I won't be until afternoon, maybe three o'clock. Something urgent, tell you later. And please keep an eye on Hussein, okay? Bye. Yazid put the receiver in its cradle and set about lighting the display cases, tidying, hurrying with the work. It was almost time for his 10.30 appointment. No end to the unfairness in his life, he thought, manager doing the peon's work. While he was winding up the steel shutters, the client arrived. Mr. Malpani of Alliance Corporation stopped by the door, checked his watch, then stared at the long steel handle in Yezid's hands. Good morning, Mr. Chenoui, you got a promotion, it seems, he said, and laughed at his own joke. Yezad smiled politely, thinking Mr. Malpani looked more like a mongoose each time he saw him. The furtive eyes on his small face darted around the shop as though searching for something to ridicule. He led him to his desk, o aired him a chair, and excused himself while he went to the bathroom to wash a spot of grease from his hand. When he returned, Mr. Malpani was peering at papers on the desk. He did not bother to stop till Yezid walked right by him and sat in his own chair. So everything is ready, Mr. Chenoui? Nodding, Yezid opened the loo and began going over the particulars of the contract. He detested the man, had done so ever since the time he had hinted, in his oily manner, how they could both make a little extra on the side if Yezid played the game. The only reason Yezid still had the account for the sports club was because Mr. Kapoor was friends with Alliance's managing director. Looks knee, said Mr. Malpani. Except for one thing. Aware of what was coming, Yezid feigned ignorance. You have once again made no provision for stomach puja, said Mr. Malpani with his yelping laugh. Every time I am telling you, you should add some extra. Little bit for your stomach, little bit for mine, and everybody is happy. You are still not learning the proper way to do business. Yezad smiled as though it was nothing but a joke. Thank you very much for coming, Mr. Malpani. As usual, it's a pleasure doing business with you. They shook hands and he walked the man to the door. He felt like washing his hands again. Such an unappetizing experience, RST thing in the morning. But he should have expected it, the way the day had begun. Nothing went well unless it started well. His mind turned again to the coral. For the past ten mornings, Roxana's RST thought on waking was to preserve the routine for him. He could sense it. She kissed his back and got out of bed, led water for the day, brushed her teeth. His turn was next in the bathroom while she made tea, went into. The front room, opened the curtains, woke the boys. Jong Gear had. To be shaken by the shoulder, but Murad was up, reading in the tent. She asked Nariman if he needed anything. No hurry, he answered as usual. I have no train to catch. She brought the teapot to the table and covered it with the cozy. Pouring for Yezid, she told him how she had surprised Murad reading by the morning light. Then, noticing Nariman's restlessness, she asked him again. It seemed wrong that he should wait with a full bladder while they, barely six feet away, drank tea and ate toast and butter and eggs. She insisted on giving him the urinal. You mustn't pretend, Papa. Holding it in is not healthy. When he was done, she tucked the urinal under the settee because Jangir was still in the toilet. It's very unsanitary to leave it sitting on the oar, said Yezid, oh ended. She ran without comment to the kitchen to fetch the boiling bath water for Murad, who was already in the bathroom, relayed the vessel, put it back on the stove for Yezid's bath, then got the basin and towel for her father. I could have carried the tapeli to Murad, said Yezad. Why don't you let me help? If you burn yourself, who'll bring home the salary? He watched as she gave her father his mouthwash. Nariman gargled, and a thread of saliva hung from his lips, stretched to the limit, it broke, clinging to his chin. Yezad looked away to keep his mind on his breakfast. Another bite and he pushed the plate aside, the egg half-eaten, while she rushed past with the basin and wet towel. The dirty water swished and threatened to splash over the rim. He inched, shrinking backwards in his chair. Better slow down. So much non-stop dancing will put you in the Guinness Book of Records or add on your back. I'm neat, don't worry, said Roxana. How can I not? Have you looked at yourself in the mirror? I've no time for mirrors. You should take a moment, see what the strain has done to your face. Does it matter? 
My face is no longer my fortune. Her remark pained him, he wanted to hold her, assure her she was as lovely as ever. Instead, he turned to Nariman. Your daughter always has smart answers. Tell her what you think. Go on, tell her truthfully. Nariman squirmed. There's some truth in each point of view. Please, no diplomacy, just be honest. See the hollows in her cheeks, she looks like a famine victim from Orissa. Nariman gave in and said what Yezid wanted to hear. He's right, Roxana, you should slow down, I keep asking you not to hurry for my sake. You think it's fair, Papa, she said, handing him his dentures. Should other people decide how and when to do the work if I'm the one who has to manage it all? She grabbed some things from the table and stamped out, calling to Murad in the bathroom not to waste time. I've upset her, said Nariman. It had to be said, she'll kill herself at this rate. Yezid drew the plate towards him again and tackled the congealed egg. He mopped up what remained of the yolk with his last piece of toast and cut the white, now gone rubbery. Jangir, returning to the front room, watched his father swallow the pieces. Finished, Daddy? He nodded, adding, good boy, as his son stacked plates, saucers, and cups, and said oh to the kitchen with the load. Nariman attempted to mend the mood, he is a wonderful child. So is Murad, said Yezid quickly, putting his father-in-law on the defensive, then regretting it. He hated himself for the habit he seemed to have of making uncomfortable the people he loved. Jangir came back from the kitchen and opened one of his jigsaw boxes. He made no attempt to build the picture, picking up pieces at random, tracing their squiggly contours with a inger. What are you doing? asked his father. Nothing, he spoke into the box. Put on your uniform. You want to make mummy shout at you? She has enough to do. He continued his desultory examination till Yezid yanked the box away and slammed the lid on. Don't make me angry. Jangir looked up, and now his father saw the tears in his eyes. What's the matter, Jahangla? He liked it when his father called him that. His brother was only called Murad. Sometimes it seemed unfair, there should have been a name to make Murad feel special too. Are you unwell, Jahangla? His father felt his forehead, bending so his face was beside his son's. Jangir smelled the tea on his father's breath. He shook his head and rubbed one eye. Mummy is crying in the kitchen. You know why? I asked her, but she won't say. Go, get ready for school. Mummy will be all right, trust me. He squeezed his son's shoulder and went to the kitchen. Jangir's ears accompanied his father. Next moment he heard. His mother sobbing, and his lower lip began to quiver. He rose, drawn towards the sound. Let them be alone, said his grandfather. He pulled in his sheet to make space on the settee. Sit, tell me what's wrong. He allowed his grandfather to hold his hand. I feel sad when they GHT, he whispered. I want them to be happy and nice to each other. It's decult for them right now. Once I am gone, things will be better. But they both like you. Why should it be decult if you are here? Liking has nothing to do with it. People have their own lives, it's not helpful when something disturbs those lives. You are so quiet, Grandpa, you don't disturb anybody. He looked at the hand holding his, the veins like cords, and felt the slight tremble in it travel into his own. I'll miss you when you go back to Jao Uncle and Kumi Auntie. M. I'll miss you too. But we have ten more days together. And afterwards, you can visit me. Agreed? Now you must get dressed. Jangir slid o the settee and rubbed his grandfather's chin, which had a larger bite to it than usual. On the way to the clothes horse he made a detour and peeked cautiously into the kitchen. His mother was in his father's arms. She still had tears in her eyes. But she was smiling. He wondered what magic passed between grown-ups, that they could go from shouting to crying to smiling in such a short time. Whatever it was, he was grateful for its existence, and went to change in the back room. Ar Kapoor's RST thought on arriving at the shop was about Hussein. Did he go for his pabaji lunch? Yezad shook his head. I took him some tea. He left it after one or two sips. Poor fellow said Mr. Kapoor, hitting a backhand in an imaginary tennis game. He was always wielding invisible bats and rackets, kicking footballs, dribbling with a hockey stick, particularly when he had something on his mind. He hurried to the storage area, cursing under his breath the bastards who had destroyed Hussein's life and the lives of thousands like him. His arm swung, hitting backhands, forehands, smacking gundas as though they were tennis balls, sending them all to perdition. How are you, Hussein Mayan? He crouched beside him in the dark corner and patted his shoulder. You'll have some tea? He took his elbow and made him rise, bringing him to the front of the shop, into the afternoon light. Yezid made three cups of tea and carried them to the counter. Chelo, Hussein, we'll all drink together. The peon thanked him and received his cup. Mr. Kapoor pointed. Out things in the street, saying look at the color of that car, and. What a big truck, and there goes so and so from the Jai Hind Book Mart. He entertained Hussein as he would a sick child. Yezid too made a contribution to the e -ort. No matter how often he watched Mr. Kapoor during these times of crises, he was touched by his employer's gentleness as he went about mending the cracks in Hussein's broken life. When Yezid had started at the shop 15 years ago, he'd assumed a formal employer-employee relationship, but Mr. Kapoor had soon read Nedit, making him a friend in condant, someone to grumble at or with. He insisted that Yezid give up the habit of calling him by his surname. They compromised, during business hours he was Mr. Kapoor, after closing time, Vikram. Besides their abhorrence for the Shiv Sena and its narrow parochial ways, they shared a lament for the city they felt was slowly dying, being destroyed by Gundaraj and Maadans, as the newspapers put it, in an unholy nexus of politicians, criminals, and police. Vikram Kapoor had arrived in the city in his mother's arms, six months old. 
he told Yezid, whenever there was an opportunity to refer to the story of his life, my family was forced to abandon everything and E.E. Punjab in 1947. Thanks, of course, to the brave British, who abandoned their responsibilities and Ed India. Sometimes, when Mr. Kapoor spoke about 1947 and partition, Yezid felt that Punjabi migrants of a certain age were like Indian authors writing about that period, whether in realist novels of corpse-led trains or in the magic realist midnight muddles, all repeating the same catalog of horrors about slaughter and burning, rape and mutilation, fetuses torn out of wombs, genitals stew ed in the mouths of the castrated. But Yezid's silent criticism was always followed by remorse. He knew they had to keep telling their story, just like Jews had to theirs, about the Holocaust, writing and remembering and having nightmares about the concentration camps and gas chambers and ovens, about the evil committed by ordinary people, by friends and neighbors, the evil that, decades later, was still incomprehensible. What choice was there, except to speak about it, again and again? And yet again? So there was no choice for us, Mr. Kapoor would say. We had to run. And we came here. But Bombay treated us well. My father started over, with zero, and became prosperous. Only city in the world where this is possible. And because of his background, he claimed his love for Bombay was special, far exceeding what a born and bred Bombayite could feel. It's the difference between being born into a religion and converting to it, he said. The convert takes nothing for granted. He chooses, thus his commitment is superior. What I feel for Bombay he will never know. It's like the pure love for a beautiful woman, gratitude for her existence, and devotion to her living presence. If Bombay were a creature of esh and blood, with my blood type, RH negative, and very often I think she is, then I would give her a transfusion down to my last drop, to save her life. At times, Yezid thought the proprietor's passion for Bombay verged on the fanatical. But he also understood that he was pouring into it his yearning for his family's past in Punjab, lost to him forever. And Bombay, perhaps by default, had become the recipient of his devotion. So Mr. Kapoor collected books about the city, old photographs, postcards, posters, and shared everything with Yezid, all the little-known facts about its history or geography that he uncovered during his researches. You know why I was late today? Let me show you. He sat Hussein down on the steps where he could watch the road, to keep him from going back to his dark corner in the storage room. Wielding an imaginary cricket bat, he went behind his desk and made a sound with his mouth, pock, of willow and ball connecting. Then, with a magician's arish, he produced two photographs out of his attaché case. I had to rush to buy these from a private collection. Before the dealers got there. He slid one across to Yezad. Great way of running a business, thought Yezad. A proprietor. Who races O to buy photographs, a peon periodically unable to. Work. He wondered what would happen here without him. He examined the print. The foreground showed a canopy of trees, beyond it, a row of graceful bungalows. In the background, behind the residences, was a maidan and more foliage. Seems like a charming place. Guess where it is? Had to be long ago Bombay, Yezad knew, to be in his boss's collection. He scrutinized it again, seeking a clue to the location. Resembles a European city more than Bombay. Mr. Kapoor laughed. If I said this is your chaotic marine line station, would you believe it? That's a photo and a half. How many years ago? Roughly 1930s. Those are military bungalows, just before they were demolished, when the army got new reclaimed land in Kalaba Cantonment. What a change, just 60 years. Look, Mr. Kapoor pointed at the picture, if you follow this side of the road, you come to Sonapur cremation and burial grounds. And your station stands here. Before the reclamation, at high tide back bay would cover the place where the railway tracks now. Run. Yezed began to see the present-day marine lines in the old photo. It had a strange EECT on him, as though he were living in two time zones, six decades apart but it was a pleasant, reassuring feeling. He relinquished the print, placing it carefully on the desk. That must be valuable. Beyond money, said Mr. Kapoor. These are my beautiful Bombay's baby pictures. Priceless. Her time of innocence. Now look at the other one. Yezid's brow wrinkled as he studied it, the place had a vague familiarity about it. Follow me, said Mr. Kapoor. They went outside to the pavement, where he pointed towards the corner, at Metro Cinema, then held up the print in Yezid's line of vision. That's it. Dobi Taleo Junction, before Metro was built. Correct, beamed Mr. Kapoor. Hussein rose from the steps, curious to see what it was that they found so exciting. Mr. Kapoor welcomed him, A.O., Hussein, Deco, very interesting. But the faded black and white photograph contained nothing to amuse the peon. He studied it to humor his employer and returned to the step. Yezid's eyes moved from the print to the junction where six roads converged, and back to the print, willing the cinema to disappear with the picture's aid. What are these low structures in the photo? I went to the Asiatic Society Library and did some research. This plot of land was acquired by the Metro Goldwyn Corporation in 1936, on a lease for 99 years, at one rupee per year. What you see in the photo are the stables of the Royal Air Force. Why would the Air Force need stables? For their horses. Very funny. Okay, so why would they need horses? To wheel the planes out of the hangars, to haul heavy. Machinery, mix of high-tech and low. Like it still is in last week. The phone company was laying state-of-the-art Brioptic cable near my house, but the ditch was being dug with pickaxes and spades, the rubble carried away in baskets on women's heads. They went inside, and Mr. Kapoor turned to the news of the day. 
He did not bury himself only in the city's past, he also burrowed in the complicated morass of contemporary politics, following every turn, every new abomination perpetrated by the government, which, he said, hurt him as though his own esh had been wounded. So now the bastards are going to shut down the Sri Krishna Commission. Which one is that? For the terrorist bombs? Yes, as well as the Babri Mosque riots. Everything was on the point of being exposed, Shiv Sena involvement in looting and burning, police helping rioters, withholding assistance in Muslim localities. Don't get excited, Mr. Kapoor, cautioned Yezed. You know what your doctor said about blood pressure. As Mr. Kapoor took a deep breath and fell silent, Hussein became agitated, is true, Sahab, yes. Police so, so budmash. Han, Hussein, Wodo such bot hai, agreed Mr. Kapoor, changing to Hindi to make it easier for the peon, who could follow their English conversation only up to a point. Hussein switched languages too, and became more eloquent, Sahab, in those riots the police were behaving like gangsters. In Muslim mahalas they were shooting their guns at innocent people. Houses were burning, neighbors came out to throw water. And the police? Firing bullets like target practice. These guardians of the law were murdering everybody. And my poor wife and children. I couldn't even recognize them. His voice was a sob now, and he stopped speaking. Han, Hussein, it was shameful, said Mr. Kapoor, writhing in his chair. More than three years have passed, and still no justice. Shiv. Sena polluted the police. And now Shiv Sena has become the government. Still sobbing, Hussein said he would bring them more tea, but Yezid O aired to get it instead. Mr. Kapoor motioned to him to wait, it would be good for Hussein, who found the brewing of tea, the serving and drinking of it, always a therapeutic pursuit. The peon soon returned with steaming cups. Shakriya, Hussein Mayan, said Mr. Kapoor. You have some? Good. Then he turned to Yezad. Am I silly to be so disgusted by these evil men? Aren't you outraged by it all? I am a born and bred Bombayvila. That automatically inoculates me against attacks of outrage. Just before closing time, Yezid handed over the cash payments for the day, the ones for which no invoices or receipts had been issued. Mr. Kapoor asked him to stay for a drink. How are you feeling, Hussein? Beer Laika? The peon nodded and received money for the errand. Two bottles of Kingshire. Jaldi, Han, before they turn warm in your hands. Hussein laughed, promising to keep his hands cool, and said oh for Marijuana Rani's beer bar at the corner. Well, said Yezid, I nailized the contract for Alliance Corporation this morning. Excellent. Come, let's sit in my OCE. Tiny though it was, the cubbyhole was air-conditioned, and Yezid was always happy to be invited in. He watched Mr. Kapoor go to the large, hard-shell suitcase in the corner and, with his back to him, dial its combination lock. The money from the cash transactions went inside. This daily routine had startled Yezid when Mr. Kapoor had RST explained it to him with a dollop of Attery, saying it was a blessing to have a Parsi employee, I don't need to worry about cash sticking to the lining of your trousers. If only there were more communities like yours. Yezad had been embarrassed. I'm sure we have our share of crooks and good-for-nothing loafers. Oh, don't be modest, the Parsi reputation for honesty is well. Known. And even if it's a myth, there is no myth without truth, no smoke without re. As a new employee, Yezid hadn't pursued it further, more concerned about the implications of tax evasion, wondering if Mr. Kapoor realized he was praising his employee's honesty in the same breath as he was instructing him to be dishonest. Of course, the proprietor had just de-ed the suitcase by calling it his pension plan, a non-standard business practice that everyone was forced to follow, thanks to the government's absurd tax laws. Now Mr. Kapoor locked the suitcase and put out two glasses to await the beer. Yazad came back to the new contract, the size of the order, estimates about net pro t, the girls were ready at the tip of his tongue. He was hoping Mr. Kapoor would be impressed, which would give him an opening to discuss improvement in his commission from the deal. Anything extra would help, with Nariman to look after. But Mr. Kapoor was not interested in talking shop. We do that all day. Bombay Sporting is now closed for the night. Meanwhile, Hussein returned with the King Shures and opened the tall bottles, pouring carefully, for he knew Sahab did not like too much foam. Smiling at his glass, Mr. Kapoor took a long draft and topped it up. He examined the bottle, still a quarter full, and held it out in Hussein's direction. Want it? Yes, Sahab, said the peon, reinforcing the response with a circular nod. After you niche drinking, you can go home. I'll lock up. Hussein gurgled it down before them. Very nice, he said, eyeing the other bottle. Want more? asked Yezad. He, too, was rewarded with a circular nod. Now you won't get drunk, will you, and come late to work tomorrow, joked Mr. Kapoor. Airy, Sahab, he laughed, only a little baby will get drunk in this much beer. An old fool like me has to drink six full ones. He drained the bottle, thanked them both, and left. They sat in silence for a while. Mr. Kapoor reclined in his chair and put his feet up on the low ling cabinet. Something I need your opinion about. Sure. You know how I'm always talking about Bombay, how much it means to me, how much it has given me. You've heard my family story. Yes, many times. Mr. Kapoor took a deep breath. I want to run in the next municipal election. Yezad stared at him, feeling that combination of action and exasperation which Mr. Kapoor often evoked in him. Why? I just told you, because Bombay is everything to me. No use complaining about crooks destroying it if, I mean, what good will it do? You always say politics is LTHY, soiling everything it touches. That's no excuse anymore. Mr. Kapoor took a swallow and put his glass down. If the woman you love is being molested, will you do nothing just because you are outnumbered? 
No, you'll defend her, end up beaten and bloody, maybe dead, and God knows how much it will help her. But you'll still intervene. Yes, but that's a personal, same thing. My beloved Bombay is being raped. Yazad knew there was no arguing with him when he spoke of the city in these Eshen blood terms. Okay, let's say you run. Which party would you choose? No party. Independent. How effective would you be? I already answered that, it doesn't matter. I cannot stand by and watch the thugs. What about Bombay Sporting? You can take my place. All the suppliers and major buyers know you. And of course I'll make it worth your while. The proposal made Yezid contemplate the possibility with new interest. The increment would help Roxana, things would know. Longer be so tight at the end of each month. He was almost ready to support the crazy idea. Then he felt ashamed of his selfishness. That's not the point. Isn't it your duty to look after your father's legacy? Doesn't your Bhagavad Gita tell you to let nothing interfere with duty? That's a good one, Yezid, he smiled. So how shall I deny my duty? Denitians are the last refuge of the scoundrel, but I really feel my father would be happy with my decision. He emptied his glass. Wish I hadn't sent Hussein home, he could have got us more beer. Have mine, I've a lot left. Are you sure? If you don't mind it from my glass. Mr. Kapoor slid his glass over. You see how we two are sitting here, sharing? That's how people have lived in Bombay. That's why Bombay has survived Uds, disease, plague, water shortage. Bursting drains and sewers, all the population pressures. In her heart there is room for everyone who wants to make a home here. Right, thought Yezid, 14 million people, half of them living in slums, eating and shitting in places not tea for animals. Nice way of sharing the gift of Bombay. But none of this would have any ECT on Vikram Kapoor launched in poetic eight. You see, Yezid, Bombay endures because it gives and it receives. Within this warp and weft is woven the special texture of its social fabric, the spirit of tolerance, acceptance, generosity. Anywhere else in the world, in those so-called civilized places like England and America, such terrible conditions would lead to revolution. Which might not be a bad thing, thought Yezad. From now on, said Mr. Kapoor, in this shop we will celebrate all festivals, Diwali, Christmas, ID, your Parsi Navros, Basaki, Buddha Jayanti, Ganesh Chaturthi, everything. We'll decorate the windows, put up appropriate greetings with lights and all. We are going to be a mini Bombay, an example to our neighborhood. I made this decision after an amazing thing I saw last week. He drank what he had accepted from Yezid's glass. Last week, I parked my car near Grant Road Station and bought a platform ticket to watch the trains and passengers. Just felt like it. He paused for another swallow, and continued, I never travel by train, I see how crowded they are when I drive past the tracks. But from the platform that day I saw something new. A train was leaving, completely packed, and the men running alongside gave up. All except one. I kept my eyes on him, because the platform was coming to an end. Suddenly, he raised his arms. And people on the train reached out and grabbed them. What were they doing, he would be dragged and killed, I thought. A moment later, they had lifted him over the platform. Now his feet were dangling outside the compartment, and I almost screamed to stop the train. His feet pedaled the air. They found a tiny spot on the edge, slipped oh. Found it again. There he was, hanging, his life literally in the hands of strangers. And he had put it there. He had trusted them. More arms reached out and held him tight in their embrace. It was a miracle, suddenly he was completely safe. So safe, I wondered if I had overreacted to the earlier danger. But no, his position had been truly perilous for a few seconds. I waited on the platform to see more trains. It was then I realized that what I had witnessed was not a miracle. It happened over and over, hands reaching out to help, as though it were perfectly normal, a routine commuter procedure. Whose hands were they, and whose hands were they grasping? Hindu, Muslim, Dalit, Parsi, Christian? No one knew, and no one cared. Fellow passengers, that's all they were. And I stood there on the platform for a long time, Yezid, my eyes led with tears of joy, because what I saw told me there was still hope for this great city. Yezid nodded quietly. What Mr. Kapoor had described, he saw. Every day, a mundane sight in the daily grind. But Mr. Kapoor had revealed an aspect of it he had not seen, and it made him wonder what else he had missed. Now you understand why I want to act before it's too late, continued Mr. Kapoor. This beautiful city of seven islands, this jewel by the Arabian Sea, this reclaimed land, this ocean gift transformed into ground beneath our feet, this enigma of cosmopolitanism where races and religions live side by side and cheek by jowl in peace and harmony, this diamond of diversity, this generous goddess who embraces the poor and the hungry and the huddled masses, this herbs prima in Indies, this dear, dear city now languishes, I don't exaggerate, like a patient in intensive care. Yezid, my friend, put there by small, sell sh men who would destroy it because their coarseness cannot bear something so grand, so any. Yezid was silent, admiring Mr. Kapoor's ability to adapt Shakespeare. Nariman would enjoy it, he would repeat it for him. Tonight. Bravo, he exclaimed. If you can do that in Hindi and Marathi as well, you'll win the election. He o aired him his hand. So I can count on your vote? For the last seven or eight years, I haven't voted in any election, not local, not national. But for you, I will vote early, and I will vote often. They laughed, and rose to lock up the shop. The boys had taken to spending some time each day after school at their grandfather's bedside. Murad discovered that grandpa and his youth used to make model airplanes. He began discussing biplanes and monoplanes from the First World War with him. 
They compared the Fokker D.7 and the Spad, the elegant sop with camel, and the deadly Fokker Eindecker, while Jangir listened. I think the camel is Biggles's favorite, said Murad. But he also is the Spit Re and Hurricane. Did you have them in your collection? No, said Nariman. They are Second World War. Unlike me, Biggies is ageless. By the time the balsa wood models came on the market I was much older, there was no time for my hobby. He shifted, trying to adjust his pillow, and the boys did it for him. Thank you. Now, speaking of time, isn't it time for your homework? You haven't told me a story yet, Grandpa, complained Jangir. You keep talking about airplanes with Murad. So Nariman continued from the day before with tales about his childhood friend Nazar, whose parents had had a veritable menagerie of birds and dogs. Though it was not a huge at, just four rooms, they had been crazy about animals, and had a golden retriever, two Pomeranians, and three Sydney silkies. Jangir's eyes shone as his imagination embraced such a lively household. Then there was a big cage with lovebirds, and enches that sang, said Nariman. And a parrot named Timuras. But he had his own private cage, which he went into at night. During the day he roamed free. He didn't try to why away. Never, he loved it there, and the dogs loved him, especially the golden retriever, Cleopatra. She let Temuras walk all over her, perch on her back, even on her head. Sometimes he would sit between her paws and rest his beak next to her nose. Jangir sought details about the birds' coloring, the dogs' diets, and their sleeping arrangements. Did Temuras talk? Temuras was an African grey parrot, he was brilliant. You see, Nazar's mother was very strict, she made him do his homework every evening. So the parrot learned to say, Nazar. Time for lessons, Nazar, in the mother's voice. As soon as my friend came home from school Temuras would start repeating that. And Nazar threatened to make a special little muzzle, to silence Temuras. Jangir laughed anxiously. Was he serious? It was a joke. Nazar loved all living creatures, even the snails we found in the school garden in the monsoon. Did he have a cat? No. No cats. Parsi families never keep cats. They consider them. Bad luck, because cats hate water, they never take a bath. Sound familiar, Jihangu, said his mother as she came in from the kitchen. Maybe you were a cat in a previous life. Cats stay clean by licking themselves, said Jangir. I read it in a book, it's very hygienic. Yes, said Nariman. But beliefs are more powerful than facts. Like our belief in spiders and cocks. I've never heard of that. Well, Parsis don't kill spiders, and they only eat the female chicken, never a cock, you must know that, from the story of Zuhak the evil one. No, I don't. Of course you do, said his mother. I told it to you when you were learning the prayers for your navjot. We read many stories from the Shanama, about King Jamsheed, about Rustam and Saurabh. And the one about King Gustav's favorite horse becoming lame, how our prophet Zarathustra cured it by passing his hand over the hawks and fetlocks. I remember those, but not the one about Zuhak. Papa, I think he just wants to hear it from you. No, really, I don't know that story. Well, said Nariman, a very long time ago, thousands of years ago, there lived an evil king whose name was Zuhak. Out of Zuhak's shoulders grew two immense serpents, ugly and smelly, that had to be fed every morning with the brains of two young men. For more than 900 years Zuhak ruled, and brought indescribable misery upon the people, devouring their sons day after day. The people prayed for deliverance, the centuries passed, and Nali, the great hero Faradun arrived to confront Zuhak. This evil monster had murdered Faradun's father, and Faradun was seeking vengeance. They met in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a terrible GHT, a GHT that lasted days and weeks. Sometimes it seemed Faradun was winning, sometimes Zuhak. But in the end Faradun overpowered him and tied him in huge chains. Unimaginably strong chains that no Lu could cut or hammer. Smash. And when Zuhak was rendered helpless, the good angel Sarosh instructed Faradun to bury him deep inside Mount Damavand. Thus, the universe was saved. And the spider and the cock? They are the ones who protect us in Faradun's absence. The evil Zuhak with his snake shoulders is still alive and very strong. With his supernatural strength, he struggles and rages all night long in the bowels of Mount Damavand, trying to free himself. Early in the morning, while it is still dark and the sun has not yet risen, when Zuhak has almost succeeded in bursting his chains, the cock crows and warns the world that the evil one will be loose again in the universe. Then the good angel Sarosh at once sends out the spider to spin its web and mend the chains that Zuhak is about to break. Thus the world is safe again. The cock and the spider keep it safe for us, one day at a time. Jangir nodded. So if people ate up all the cocks and killed all the spiders, there would be no one to help us GHT all the evil. Exactly. My friend Nazar loved this story. He would sit for hours gazing at a spider spinning its web. Especially outdoors, in sunshine after rain, with drops like jewels caught in the gossamer. Jangir began scrutinizing the ceiling, walls, and corners of the room, looking for a web. He wanted to see for himself how beautiful it might be. Murad began to laugh. My brother is a crackpot, Grandpa. Now he'll worry about Zuhak and start protecting spiders. I'm not a crackpot. I know there isn't any Zuhak. It's just a story, like Santa Claus. They're both real, said Murad. And Zuhak will catch you if you sleep on the balcony. You're saying that because you want to steal my turn tomorrow. I think you're right, Jangir, chuckled his grandfather. But even if Zuhak were real, he wouldn't bother you. He'd be busy with things like diseases and famines, wars and cyclones. The room did not reveal any spiders. 
Jangir made his mother promise. Next time she found a web, she would let him look at it RST. And when your leg is all right, Grandpa, can we go to meet? Your friends dogs and birds? But that was a long time ago. Jangir, those pets are, he paused, making a sorrowful gesture with his hand, are gone. He saw Jangir's reluctance to accept that the pets were dead, and continued with more directness, I remember when Cleopatra died. My SSC exams were only a week away. But I went with Nazar and his parents to bury her. A friend of theirs who had a cottage in Bandra said they were welcome to use the back garden, so we went in a taxi. It was a rainy day. We had to try many taxis before one agreed, and even then, the driver refused to allow a dead dog on the seat. We put Cleopatra in the boot, wrapped in a sheet. Nazar and I carried her. The sheet got wet and muddy. That was the RST time I saw Nazar crying. The sorrow from 62 years ago, of the burial of a dog he'd never seen, arced across time and touched Jangir. Aching with grief, he asked, did you and Nazar dig the hole? No, the gardener had it ready. It was next to a lemon tree. Then Nazar's mother wanted to see Cleopatra one more time, and Nazar unfolded the wet sheet. I think that was a mistake. The beautiful golden brown coat was dirty and yellow, the hair in knots and tangles. We quickly put back the sheet and buried her. Elbows on his knees, face cupped in his hands, Jangir sat gazing at the oar. He had run out of questions. You see, having a dog is not easy, said his mother. It's not just laughing and playing with the dog. You have to be prepared for the sadness when it dies. I know that. He turned to his grandfather again. But your friend might have new pets, we could go and see those. Nariman shook his head. My friend Nazar, he died two years ago. A cloud passed over Jangir's face. How old was he? Seventy-six. He counted, Grandpa was 79, if his friend was still alive, he would be 78. One year younger than Grandpa. And yet the friend was dead. He felt his hands go cold and tears start to stab his eyes. The arithmetic was threatening his grandfather's life, he wished he could forget the cruel numbers. He rose abruptly and went to the balcony. Roxana mimed for her father, drawing a line with her inger from her eye down along her cheek. Murad pretended to be Una Ekted, more grown up. Nariman waited for a while before calling, Jangir, do you know the story of Faridun's life after he defeated Zuhak? No. It's about Salim, Tur, and Irij, the three sons of Faridun. Don't you want to hear the end? Yes, he answered, but stayed on the balcony because his eyes were still wet. Gazing down at the blurred pavement, he saw his father appear in the lane, striding homewards. Yezed used his latchkey, disappointed that Jangir was not at the door, and asked Roxana why her son was standing on the balcony. She hushed him, it would embarrass Jihangu if he heard, he'd been crying because of a story Papa had told, which had made him sad. Jihangla. Come here, talk to me. Jangir gave a nail wipe to his eyes and went in with a weak smile. Yezad took his hand. Now what story is this, chief? Why are you making my son cry? When I tell stories, it makes everyone laugh. He went on giving Nariman a mock scolding, but his annoyance tinged with jealousy was unmistakable. Jangir wrenched his hand out of his father's. Don't be angry with grandpa, he said, aware that the tears he had got rid of had returned to his eyes. Okay, then I'll be angry with you. Tears before I leave for work, tears when I come home. Jangir's shoulders shook with silent sobs as he went to the balcony again. Turning to enter the back room, Yezid walked into wet clothes on hangers suspended in the doorway. In a rage he tore the clammy shirts from his face and hung them aside. Is this a place to dry the washing? There's no space on the balcony because of the tent, said. Roxana softly, determined to stay calm. Where can I dry them? Take them to Chateau Felicity. Your bloody brother and sister can dry them in their seven rooms. She gathered up the clothes from the oar, shook them out, hung them up again. T, Yezda? He did not answer. She made it anyway, and asked him how it was at work. How do you think? Look at this, a grease on my shirt. I had to do the peon's work, open the bloody shutters. I'll wash it in surf, the stain will disappear. And what about your father's gloomy face? Now he's making Jangir gloomy as well. Doesn't anybody know how to smile or laugh? Eshish, Papa will hear. You used to call it his philosopher's face, now it's gloomy just because he's staying here? In the front room, Murad asked his grandfather to start the next story, the one about Faridun's three sons. Nariman shook his head, afraid Yezid might take it as competition. Later. Come, do your homework now. Roxana brought the tea to the dining table and sent both boys to their desk. She gathered up the washing from the chairs to spread out later, after Yezid went to bed. He saw her arms full of damp clothes. Leave them, I only need one chair, he tried to make amends. While he drank his tea she sat with him and chatted about how Vili Cardmaster had bought onions and salt for her this morning from the bunya. You were right, she really is quite nice. Ask her for a matka tip. If we win big, we can hire a hospital. Ah yeah. I will starve before I gamble, or let you gamble. Calm down, I wasn't serious. He watched his father-in-law's hands trying to rest but thrashing about in the region of his chest, as though he were beating it. Murad came and sat with them. You know, Grandpa, he said, you should play the bongos. And why is that? The way your ingers move, you'll be good at it. He attempted his idea on a chair, making his ingers tremble like his grandfather's to see if they could produce a thrum. Don't be a clown, said Yezid. It's not funny. He made him return to his lessons in the back room, told him to follow his younger brother's example. Jangir heard the piece o airing and smiled into his book.